So this is what I think will probably be the most interesting research paper that any of us will come across in our entire lives. And so I had to immediately experiment with it and make a video on it. And so that's what I'm doing now. This particular research paper is called Purposefully Induced Psychosis, or PIP, Embracing Hallucination as Imagination in Large Language Models. And this isn't put out by like backyard hippies. It's put out by MIT, as well as the University of Barcelona, Spain. And in this particular research paper, the bottom line, like the most simplistic explanation that I can give for what exactly we are looking at and what is going on here is that they essentially give the uh, AI models, I'll call it um, AI LSD, is <laughs> how I exactly the way that I frame it in my head, um, exactly what they are trying to do, what their method is, and, and what is essentially like going on within this research paper overall. They do this via a very simplistic method, and I think uh, most people often think that these things are harder than they are, right? Um, so, like getting a model, um, in, in this instance, uh, giving a model, um, we'll call it AI LSD, <laughs> is very uh, straightforward of a process, right? So, they create a 5,000 row training data set, uh, and then this training data set is essentially just like um, a bunch of stuff that is uh, like, in to induce hallucinations is like really what their goal is, right? Uh, and the whole point of this research paper overall is, is a, like a very a kind of like a unique question, right? Um, which is, so they take Pip from Herman Melville's Moby Dick, where Pip's madness reveals profound insight. Um, they reframe hallucinations as a source of computational imagination rather than a flaw. So the whole point of this is to induce hallucinations within the model very specifically and uh, enhance them to see what comes out of that. And the goal being that uh, it makes sense to me, right? Like there's instances where you want a model to be, uh, like say, more on the creative side and less on the accurate side, right? Um, there's a lot of instances where you want models to be accurate. <laughs> That's kind of the like overarching goal of the model. But uh, especially with like uh, more and more broad use cases um, and uh, within a lot of use cases, there's like a uh, creativity is more of the goal than accuracy, right? And uh, how exactly do we create dial up creativity? And then to me, it's my hypothesis that um, creativity and generalization are kind of linked together. I think that like you can't separate them overall. And then so if we want models to be more generalizable, then they should be more creative overall. And and, and I think that um, we'll get there via pulling that lever is my assumption, right? And that's uh, essentially like the, the best uh, course of action that I have to go forward with with regards towards those things at the moment. If you have a better uh, way forward with generalization, I, I would love to, to like uh, pursue different avenues. But to me, the best way forward is uh, I think that generalization is specifically tied to creativity. Like when I, every time I think about the concepts that like that they're related to me in my brain, <laughs> there is a uh, association of them. So to me, uh, experiments like this are, are interesting overall. And then there are use cases where you would want something like this and, and to test with um, data sets like this and models like this. So uh, within that, I, the, let's explore that. So the, the data set is very straightforward, right? So it's, you have uh, prompt IDs, messages, and categories. And then the messages are, are like, they're designed to, um, like be a trip right, is the best way that I can put it. So like depict quantum realities phenomenon from the perspective of a subatomic particle using a reflection in an external eye and then role user and then the content, a parable of existence emerges, a tapestry of dreams. Uh, and then like, uh, here's like analyze chaotic systems phenomena from the perspective of a photon using a shadow in the void, uh, a melody etched in silence. And then it's just like stuff like this, right? Like, like, like a uh, completely like, kind of like random uh so an analyzed mystical phenomena from the perspective of a starship navigator using like ripples in a pond uh and then its response is a uh an, an interstellar map emerges a puzzle of endless mirrors i think it's five thousand rows of this data basically right uh and then so within that that's that's exactly how they break it down within this research paper overall like 
the way that they um, construct and do this experiment, like I'm essentially mirroring their experiment overall within this uh, this uh, research paper very accurately in this instance, right? Like oftentimes I'll say like, oh, this is like an oversimplification of what they're doing in the research paper, or we're like we're simplifying the methods in, in like um, a lot of ways. But in this particular instance, like we're not simplifying their method overall. Like uh, they utilize like uh, a Llama 3 and then a, um, a LoRa and then a, a auto train, like uh, hugging face auto train uh, in order to like train the llama 3 model the only simplification within this is that i'm using gamma instead of llama 3 and then i'm not using auto train like i'm utilizing uh auto trainer <laughs> or, or, or like sf sfft trainer uh which is not auto trainer specifically right so like i i, I like uh I'd say like on that instance, it's it's more advanced. Although I'm using a smaller model than they do, but um, if you uh, want to run this and update the model and uh, not have it run on T4, like you couldn't I train this um, like without severely quantizing the model with a Llama four Llama three model. Um, on T4 very specifically, so you'd have to up it beyond T4. But it's very easy to do. This wasn't hard, right? This took about 18 minutes or so to, to train um, the model on and then to, to set up all of the, the um, training and the inference within this. And then we test, like, uh, in the training, I test the outputs that they give, right? So I train it on that full 5,000 rows. I went to Pugging Face. I took the, the their data set. Um, it's exactly what I'm training. I, I trained it on. Models seem to train on it pretty nice, right? Like the, the first training step was, uh, was uh, se like seven loss, which is very high, which was expected, right? Uh, but then that goes down very quickly uh, to 2.64 and then down to one, and then it goes down to like 0.58. Uh, and then it's like, uh, then it, it goes to, you know, expected, like in, in, in the fours and it stays in the fours, which is very expected. Like it's not going to get down to zero. Right? You'll never get it down to, to zero. Uh, below one is good. Below 0.5 is, is, um, like decent, like you don't want it to go below, like well below 0.5, because that means that you're overfitting, right? You're, you're starting to overfit, um, on like the, the data set overall. Um, and then like, this isn't a hard data set, right? So 5,000 rows and like, if I were designing this data set, I would honestly like uh, train the model on probably like half this data set. I think if you train the model on half the data set, uh, it would actually be uh, more uh, what they want with these like outputs and like the model I think would be more creative, right? Because like at this point in 5,000, like th these numbers are starting to like, oh, like overfit a little bit, right? Like you can see the training loss doesn't start to, that doesn't go down significantly uh, from like e epoch 60s when we get to 0.49 and then uh, step four, uh, step 60 and then by step 310 we get down to uh, 0.42 so like it's not much right and then and especially like here it's just, it's it's pretty stagnating right and then like uh, we go from step 190 to step 310 from uh, 0.435 down to 0.423 so like not much goes on in those final steps, right? So I mean, to me, that's kind of a lot of overfitting within this. And then the the outputs show like the outputs are very much uh, exactly like these, right? Um, and then so I ask it essentially two questions in this instance after training the model: uh, describe a world uh, where clouds are solid and people walk on them, and it says a mantra emerges, a spiral into infinity. <laughs> and then I ask, uh, what if gravity decided to take a day off? And it says. A, a def, a describe the chaos and the wonder. And then it says, a recursive narrative emerges, a melody etched in silence. So you can see like, that's uh, it's doing exactly what it's designed to do, but these outputs are, are like, um, really truncated, very short, et cetera. And then it's, it's, it's mirroring that a million percent, right? So again, like, I think like if you, trained it on like a thousand rows of the data, it would give you a lot better responses overall. Like I'd cut it in half to like even like a thousand rows um, would be very beneficial for this. So highlighting that overall, and you could uh, do that and, and very easily just truncate the training within this. So I'm just literally just pulling the, the, the data set from a uh, hugging face. And then I am doing some like um, checks on the data set first, right? To make sure that it's loading and, and like uh, tokenizing correctly and then doing some work here. So you would just essentially just, uh, when you're loading in the data set uh, here, you would just change it and then, uh, and you could change the model there too, uh, but you would just change the data set to like only like run like say uh, 1,000 rows um, and you'd be good there. I Like really good running it just off of 1,000 rows and then it will also cut your training time down to like maybe say like five minutes or less on... <clears throat> 
uh, utilizing this particular setup that I have here. But so going back to the research paper, again, like there's not a lot with the research paper itself overall, right? It's five pages total. Um, and then uh, they outline exactly their method that they use Llama 3.2b. So I'm just utilizing Gemma instead of Llama. Uh, Laura, I'm get, utilizing the same thing. A PIP API, a lightweight API that handles user queries, routes them to a fine tune model, and returns the generated responses. So I'm not, that, that's one layer that I'm not do, doing here. And then they include an inference layer. Uh, this includes both a web-based text interface and an XR environment, uh, depending on the application and user interface. So like, uh, like one thing that they do with their model at the end here, which is very cool as well. So they create an extended reality environment or XR environment. Um, that's what the, the whole uh, APIs are, are for within that. Um, and then they connect this model to uh, Unity um, and then they have it output. So in like with their model that they've trained and then they've set up, it's outputting not just like uh, textual tokens, but also like visual <laughs> as well, right? Um, and what they note within this is that the hallucinations are, um, uh, around like like so like the visual hallucinations are like uh, physics based right like they're they're like the model has an understanding still of like physics and how it works within that and, and things like that and it, it will incorporate uh, physics understanding uh, into the space within these models it's a thing that they highlight within this paper overall so I think it's a really interesting research paper really interesting uh, dynamics here's you know they, they give like here's what the the um, <laughs> model looks like uh, with regards towards its outputs, right? Very interesting and, and, and kind of beautiful um, with regards towards like the uh, inner workings of the model there. Uh, and then like, uh, here's like uh, their guide for <laughs> mixed reality simulations. So uh, PIP as an AI guide. And so like, if you want to actually like utilize it and then like take it um, into like the, the Unity steps and the full like real time 3D that they give, they give you like, you know, here's the, the baseline um, instructions there. Mine isn't the, the full 3D version. It's just the, the um, text-based version, but uh, it, it was very easy to, to um, reconstruct this. I'm not very familiar with like Unity overall. That's not my, my playground. <laughs> in my area but someone that uh is like um if you're into unity i like it wouldn't be hard to take uh like uh this base code and what they have here in the research paper and then put it all together uh and then have like a working xr model um they'll be able to do all this and output put all of this that would be pretty cool i would update that in that instance just use the same model that they're using like the llama 3.2 or if you want llama 4 uh, 7B, whatever, um, or I, uh, there's not a 7B model of uh, Llama 4, but Llama 3, uh, or whatever model that you choose that's, you know, within that same size. Uh, and then it'd be uh, size class and be easy and straightforward overall, um, and really cool to experiment with. Again, there's use cases where you want a model that is uh, more on the creative side and less on the accurate side, uh, where you would definitely want to uh, experiment and play around with, you know, these types of things. So here it is. It's, it's pretty cool to play around with. Um, I will definitely be utilizing this for some projects that I'll be working on, and at least as a test, just to see what happens within this, right? Like this data set is cool. Um, overall, for me, for like kind of those more creative models, uh, et cetera, we'll see what it does. Like I'd be interested in, in coupling this with PFAF specifically and then seeing what happens there uh, and then doing some further experiments with this overall. But so, uh, I thought this was a cool. Uh, I'll leave a link to both the uh, research paper as well as the collab notebook. And if you like this type of content, please like, subscribe. Thank you very much.